Hi, this is Kevin Savitz. I normally do interviews with Atari-related people for Antic, the Atari 8-bit podcast. But today, two interviews with people who created Microzine, an educational magazine that was published for Apple II computers. Amy Kefauver was an editor at Scholastic from 1985 through 1988, where she was responsible for the creation and production of Scholastic Microzine, a five times per year software magazine for elementary students grades four to six. She also created and launched Scholastic Microzine Junior for kindergarten through fourth grade students. Lori Hopping was a freelance writer and editor who wrote several twist-a-plot games for Microzine, including Escape from Antcatraz. Both of these interviews took place on July 29th, 2015. A partial transcript of these interviews appeared in the September 2015 issue of Juiced.gs Magazine, Volume 20, Issue 3. Complete transcripts are available at www.computingpioneers.com, a website that offers transcripts of interviews with computing pioneers. These interviews also ran an audio form in the May 2016 episode of the Open Apple podcast. Here we go with Amy Kefauver. I was an English lit major in college, and I knew I wanted to be in children's publishing, so I came to New York and um, Scholastic was my second job, and I started off in the uh, book club division where, I don't know if you remember, but, you know, getting those little cheapy paperback books in your classroom, um, which I loved as a kid, and I got to work oh, yeah, there. yeah, I love that too, sure. I know. <laughs> it was like the best part of the month was when the Scholastic books came. And um, so I just sort of worked my way through a couple of different divisions at Scholastic. And then um, I was in the classroom magazine division, uh, working on a magazine for fifth grade kids. And Scholastic recognized that um, computers were coming into the classroom, and so they needed to have a presence there. And so they started a whole new division. And uh, very quickly after they started up, they posted um, some jobs, and I applied, and I was completely thrilled to be part of it. So you were uh, editor of Microzine? Um, I joined as an associate editor. Um, the guy that was my boss was a part of the very first team, and um, after I had worked for him, I think for about a year, I think it was about a year, I got, he went on to other projects within the division, and then they bumped me up to editor. Was Microzine marketed directly to schools? I mean, who, who, was the, who was supposed to be buying Microzine? Was it the schools? Was it parents? It was the schools, and it was whoever was making the buying decision. Usually it was often a sort of a, a, a central person for a school district or something. Um, and so our marketing people were going directly to the schools and we published um, guides for the teachers, teaching, you know, documentation and stuff for the teachers and uh, and then material for the parents. But it was really the schools that were, were our customers. And did you have a sense of if a school, would they buy one copy? Were they buying 10 copies? Were they buying one for the whole lab? I mean, well, that, that, that turned out to be an interesting uh, marketing event. Um, we started publishing it as, as a magazine, which meant that you would buy a subscription and you would get five issues during the course of a school year. So they did that initially. Um, then it turned out that they could also make additional monies by selling uh, individual back issues. Um, and... Unfortunately, very quickly on, we heard from teachers. They said, oh, we absolutely adore Microzine. And then the salesperson would say, great, so we can sign you up for another year. And they said, we don't need to because we've got a whole new bunch of kids and these are great and they're holding up. And uh, so we have everything we need. And we thought, well, gee, that isn't what we want to hear. Oh. So right. they marketed it as a library on a disk, meaning you are always building your library. And and as it turned out, you know, certain elements were the same issue to issue. There's always a twist of plot. But the other three programs were always different. And since the goal was to have this be an 
an initial introduction to kids to the you know what the computer can do and all the different utilities and things that it can do, um, we were able to keep tapping into different uh, curriculum areas, you know, science or history, and and different things that the computer could do. You know, very quickly did a database and very quickly did um, oh accounting and a little word processor and stuff. But after that, it was more hitting different areas of the curriculum so the teachers could see the value in continuing to subscribe. So it um, sort of to go back what you were, uh, asked me a little bit ago was, uh, I think it was used both in computer labs and in individual classrooms. But were you about to ask me how did we decide what the content was? Yeah, how did you decide what the curriculum was? It, were you guys, I mean, Scholastic, I'm sure, knows a little bit about <laughs> about making curriculum, but what, what were, was this was in, in uh were you working with, with outside teachers, or were you making it up as you went along, or how was that? Well, we, we had a really good, you know, Scholastic's a big company, and so we had a lot of resources, and the marketing division was um, full on, and, they, and the salespeople knew what the different curriculums were going to be. Sort of nationwide, there's a lot of, you know, consistency in, in what's taught in fifth grade or fourth grade or whatever. And... So we knew that for the Twisted Plots, we just had to get the reading level right and and topics that the kids would find intriguing. And um, and then after that, it was, um, it sort of look, I would look over the year and try to have a good balance so that we, you know, had a good mix of science and math and history and sort of split it up between the issues so that one wasn't heavily weighted you know, in one area or another. So um, luckily with the editors that were there on staff and the programmers who were, you know, hugely instrumental in all of this, there was never a lack of ideas. And um, sometimes the, the hard thing was, you know, what do we leave out? Because there are all these things that we want to do and we can only do about 20 programs a year. And they also, so, you know, we were constrained by... Um, the, the limits of the machine and, you know, how much we could fit on a disk and that kind of thing. Do you know how many subscribers you had? I mean, at average or at peak or just any sort oh, of idea? Goodness. I'm sure I knew at one point. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I'd have to go back and I'd have to find that out for you. We had a lot. Um, yeah. There was I, I sort of did myself then. I had decided at one point that I wanted to um, – have every kid get a personal response and and it was certainly easy enough for the kids that just wrote me out of the blue but then we started doing these little monitor mysteries where they could write in and get a little certificate if they completed it and I always tried to put in a little additional note so it, it was fine because I absolutely adored my job and I loved everybody I worked with but there were a couple of years there where I was working seven days a week because I would come in on Saturday and Sunday and and do nothing but answer letters wow. and um yeah, and even then, and after a while, we hired someone to sort of generate a form letter, but then I, we would always put personal notes on the bottom to the kids. And I, I just remember there were a lot of letters. So um, that's I, I'm embarrassed that I don't know the answer to that, but um, uh, as I said, well, that's fine. something I could probably find out for you. If, if you can, it would be interesting to find out. Yeah. Yeah. I was just curious if it was hundreds or thousands of subscribers. Yeah. Oh, it was definitely um, thousands. I just I just don't know how many. It, it was definitely in the thousands because it was um, it was making money for us for a while, so that was great. Well, that, you've led me right into another question. I, I was going to ask uh, what what feedback you got from students. It sounds like you got a lot of it. Can you tell me more about about that? We got a lot of. Um, I think I would have to say, almost without exception, all the, all the feedback from the kids was was overwhelmingly positive. And they would ask for stuff, and they would ask, you know, why can't you do this, or why can't you do something about that? Um, you know, they wanted twist the plots about dinosaurs, and they wanted, you know, outer space and all that kind of stuff. Um, some of the teachers were more critical, which you would expect, and... We always tried to listen to that, and when it came time to do um, uh, an advisory board, I tried really hard to fill it with people that had made really th critical but thoughtful comments because I thought they could help us um, best uh, to you know make it better. Um, but the kids loved the monitor mink uh, the the uh, listening the monitor mysteries a lot. They liked the twisted plots a lot. 
um, and anything that sort of smacked of a video game, of course, was really popular. We did a, a little program on light refraction, and we sort of took a play off of the game Pong, which um, I'm sure you're too young to remember, but I remember it, and it was um, it was this great game with a little ball bouncing back and forth, and we did it so that you would move um, a little device that would um, sort of, it was light coming from a flashlight, and if you move the little barrier correctly, you could refract it back to hit a target. So that was pretty fun because they thought they were, oh, well, they were playing a game, but the, the, uh, there were also some good principles behind it. So that kind of stuff was usually a hit. Um well, tell me about the, can you give me some examples of the critical feedback from teachers? What were they upset about? Oh, boy, this was so long ago. I'm trying to remember now. Um, a lot of times it was that the programs didn't do enough, that they weren't powerful enough. And, you know, it's. I'm sure it sounded lame to them, but it was just a factor that, you know, we had 64K or 128K. It was really little back then. And there really is only so much you can do, especially when you've got programs that are um, have a lot of graphics. You know, everything was so primitive back then. It took enormous amounts of space. And so we had to be careful and try to get in as much information, but also keep the kids engaged. So there was that. Um, they said, you know, this, this was kind of a puny program. It was like, uh, we're really doing the best we can with the limits of the machine. Um, let's see. So there was that. Uh, I think that some of them felt that it wasn't um, scholarly enough, that a lot of it was, was sort of too much fun. And the earlier twist of plots were, were absolutely, you know, just pure fiction. And after a few years, um, we got a couple of fabulous writers who were science writers as well as good um, fiction writers, and they would start to do things that um, the way that you move through the twist of plot was to uh, read, you know, comprehend what you were reading, answer some scientific questions, make some good guesses. So um, this woman whose name I suggested to you, Lori Hopping, um, wrote one called Escape from Antcatraz, and it, you learned a lot about ants and their uh, biology and, you know, social cultures and everything to get through the story. So so that was one response we did in in reaction to feedback from teachers. So was there a was there a, a killer app in Microzine? Like, the, what was the thing that you came out with that everyone was just like, "Yes, this is this is awesome." You no, know, what? Uh, well, I well, guess, I think what, is, what, what, what were... was your what was your Oregon Trail? I guess. Ah, <laughs> uh -huh. um, I don't think we had one. Um, we had. The, the twist of plots were hugely popular with the teachers as well, um, I think because they could see the value in the kids. It also took them a while to complete. So I think the teachers felt that if it's taking them this long to get through then, and they're engaged, um, that's good. And they saw that as a positive. Um, God, you know, Scholastic Software had some real rock star standalone things like, um, oh, my goodness, my friend programmed one it was about math ah it'll come to me um there was there was a math thing that was just a knockout and bank street writer was great um point of view was great the, but those are all like not microzine um i didn't realize you guys were bank street writer i thought that was protobum it was protobum but they scholastic was affiliated with it in the early years so there there was some definite connection and they I think they published it in certain parts and um I would have to go back again and find out what the exact legal uh arrangement was, but it was sort of like Scholastic published the US edition of Harry Potter. So yes, it's JK Rowling obviously and, and her publisher, but Scholastic right. had the US rights and we had we had some affiliation with Bank Street Writer that was of course, you know, hugely popular. Um and then, and then we went on to success with writing, which was, you know, exclusively scholastic. So, you know, it all sort of evolved over a couple of years. Um, 
but but I think it was really the twist of plots that were just you know the most popular. I, I wouldn't say that Microsine had a standalone Oregon Trail. <laughs> was Steve Gass the man you were mentioning before, who who started off as editor before you came in? Uh, no, that was Jeff Siegel. Steve Gass was um, in a more um, executive managerial area. He was absolutely the f- the first wave and. I was only there for a little while before he went on, but he was he was part of that first team for sure. Okay, I, there was a name that I saw I had, had in my notes, and I thought I'd I will find out uh-huh. where where it went. I, and I, I gotta say, I love on the the twist of plots, at, le- at least some of them that I've seen. Um, when you start it off, it's just like you want to play as a boy or a girl. I'm like that's awesome. <laughs> There's yeah. something awesome about that. Um, well, that also helped with the pronouns too. <laughs> <laughs> when, you know. I but I re- actually, that's so funny. I remember dem- demoing that, but there was one, um, oh, my God, it might have been Pirates of the Soft Seas or something, but you had to answer that, and then you got to type in your name, and I was sort of horsing around, and Jeff actually was with me there at that demo, and so I typed in that I was a boy, and then, I typed in that my name was Sue, and I looked over at Jeff, and he's like, oh, my God, a boy named Sue. And he's like, so corny. But, you know, the audience thought it was funny. I thought it was hilarious. So, <laughs> But, you know, tried to make it fun for the kids, you know, that they could fool around with it a little bit and still get their work done. Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I had read something about the, the, the Choose Your Own Adventure books that when they had come out, they, they learned early on that right. – that, um, a, a, a girl would read a book with a boy protagonist, but a boy wouldn't read a book with a girl protagonist. So, but on the computer I believe platform, that. Yeah. Yep. Um, on the computer platform, you could you could play it any way you wanted to. So. Exactly. Um, and right, the so the, the other it. thing too with those twist of plots at the beginning was another change that we made was um, uh, in the beginning you could sort of. There were there were multiple endings, and um, as you can imagine, you know that's kind of complicated to to structure that and map it out so that all of the stories make sense. But um, we we decided, you know, pretty quickly that it really made, especially when you're you know introducing the curriculum and stuff, um, you want them to succeed by making you know the correct science decisions or the correct decisions based on what they've read. So we we tried to have lots of branches, but we tried to have basically one ending. So that's another reason why they got a lot longer. We wanted to make it more challenging. So I know you were responsible for a lot of content in there besides the the twist of plots and articles Mm -hmm. and and things. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about creating that stuff? Sure. Um, some of it uh again there was there was a lot of input from lots of folks we um we originally worked with a group out in Minnesota a team of developers and they were fabulous and they had lots of ideas um but then once the editors sort of got their hands on it um lots of people were suggesting ideas and coming up with things and um, so we would, I would try to sketch out for the year, you know, the curriculum areas, and we would try to find ideas that we could make fit into those slots. And, you know, how how can you take the idea of uh, light refraction and you get science, but then how can you make it fun? And um, so, so, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, just a lot of freewheeling ideas and a lot of late nights and um and then some of the editors would would say, "I want this to be entirely mine, and I'm going to go off and and create this whole thing and come back and run it by you." So, one of them was um, uh, it was almost like a Rube Goldberg device where you had to reach go from one side of the screen to the other, but you had to know a sequence of events. And you know, if you press the toaster down, the toaster flies up, and the bird is flying over right at the, that same moment, and the bird picks up the toast and drags, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it was, uh, you know, just sort of piling ideas in there. And some people would take ownership of it and go off and develop it, and then we might tweak it. 
Um, and then a lot of times the graphic artists would come up with fabulous ideas too. And um, this one woman uh, was sort of, Loretta Jones was kind of a pioneer back in the day for um, these graphics and realized that, and this shows you how primitive it was, the graphics would come up and they would be essentially drawn on the screen in, in, in the same sequence that the artist created it. And she realized that she could use that to her advantage. So when they did a twist plot called Fossils Alive, um, it's, it came up as a dinosaur skeleton, but then it sort of came to life based on the order in which she drew the skin and the features of the dinosaur. So it looked like it was sort of emerging. And that was just taking taking advantage of what the technology was at the time. But it's basically what games and what things we thought were fun that we could say, well, can we hang a math hat on this somehow? <laughs> because then we could do this um, with coins or something. And, um, and, and we, you know, we're, we're, we're all obviously all, you know, playing games on our own and um, coming in and playing games from competitors and stuff and just really sort of getting loosened up for the day and getting all excited about doing stuff that we really loved. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, it was a good, it was a good time in my life too, my career. It was a really fun time. It was a very, very uh, lively group there. That's great. Awesome. So Microzine yeah. was uh, supposed to be from grades four to six. And then at some yeah. point you you guys came out with Microzine Junior, which I believe was kindergarten through fourth. Yeah. Um, I that thought go? that was a little bit too wide a range, but you know, that's that's a marketing decision. Mm. I I would have loved to have pulled it down to K one two, um or maybe one, two, three. I just for what the kids are able to do, you know, it, it was awfully wide range. But but it was fun because, you know, we got to try different things and and again, step back on those twisted plots and get the reading level down and the number of decisions down and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, the re- what got me into this is I, I had read something in an old magazine saying that there was microzine for the Atari, and it seems like, like some clarification from you, either it never came out for the Atari or it was only out for a little while than when you guys decided Apple's... The, the I think out. it was just one issue, quite frankly. I think it was just one issue. Um, and it was this that crazy parallelogram box, I don't, or rhombus-shaped box. I don't know if you ever saw that. Um, I've seen that. Which was, that. yeah, quickly discarded. The box, it wouldn't fit on any shelf. Um, that There was a lot of feedback on that, you can imagine. The teacher, what the hell am I supposed to do with this box? I can't, I can't put it on a shelf. It flies off. Um, I think it came out for for one issue on the Atari. It was like um, they had an interview with the uh, older brother from ET and um, something. And, and that was also that idea was quickly discarded because boy, that gets out of date before it's even published. You know, the kids have long moved on by the time that comes out. Um, yeah. So I'm. So, I was so sorry. You know, you said you're doing this podcast for Atari, and it's like I don't have that much to offer you. I'm afraid. Well, it's well. I'm throwing. I'm doing throwing doing a favor for my Apple brother, and it's okay. We're all we're all sixty five okay. friends in sixty five oh two. It's all right. <laughs> all right. Um, so yeah, you said it was uh, stuff went out of date. What was the, what was the lead time on on production? Uh that was that was one of the hardest things. Um. Well, let's see. We did five issues a year. We were at least two months, at least two months. It was usually more like four was safer because, you know, you had to create this stuff, but then you had to test it um, rigorously because, you know, this stuff's going into the schools, and especially at the beginning, um, teachers had to be convinced that they wanted this and needed it, and they were so certain that it was going to be a problem and it was going to be buggy and, we we just decided that we were going to create something that one the kids could totally use on their own. So the documentation was was pretty light, you know, because there's a lot of documentation built into the actual programs, um, which they could get just by pressing a question mark, and you'd get a help screen of whatever you're doing at that moment. But um, 
but we also had to test it rigorously. And we hired a lot of local kids, uh, high school kids, uh, to come in and bang on those on those programs, and they were triumphant when they could make it crash. And of course, we you know we insisted that they write a very detailed report on what the heck did you do to make this crash, and then we would take it back to our offices, try to recreate it, and then we would go back to the programmers and um, and work on that. So that that probably took the longest, and then of course you need the time to um, produce these things and produce these discs and get them packaged. So um, if I'm remembering correctly, there was some times where we skated pretty close to the edge and it was two, two months lead time. It was more like four was better because that meant that, you know, you weren't having hysterics to get it done. But, you know, five discs during the school year is a lot. And that meant that you were always had something in different stages of production. We had... I had a big wall in my office, and um, we had the status of every program. It was like a war board or something where where was each piece? You know, was it with the developer? Is it with the programmer? Is it with this editor? Is it in testing? So we could keep it moving through. So some of the microzine features were later compiled into themed bundles. For example, right. Haunted House and Mystery Pinecrest Manor were reissued as Tales of Mystery. Um were, were, do you know if many of those bundles were released, and, and was there any reason other than, than marketing and have another thing to sell, or? It that well, that's why um, it was um, a way to reach another market. So that if a teacher, that was almost more too for um, the labs when if the kids didn't have a lot of time, and they could come in and pick up sort of a twofer. And so we tried to bundle them in subject areas or interest areas that, you know, if a kid likes this mystery, maybe they want to just do two mysteries for the for the afternoon or something. It, it was a marketing. It was a way to take the stuff. It was very expensive to produce the stuff um, and how to get the most bang out of it, all of this effort and all of these months of, you know, this huge team of people to see if we could bundle it and, and sell it just in a different way and maybe increase the market a little bit. So, uh, some of the later, going back to Twisted Plot for just a minute, uh, the later Twisted Plot mm-hmm. stories moved from a, a choose-your-own-adventure format to more of a, tra- a computer text adventure format with players and exactly. Um What right. prompted that change? Well, um, I guess it was more of an editorial thing. We just felt like, well, it was two things. One is an editorial thing. You feel like if you're telling a story... You're telling a story, not multiple stories. It just felt if you had five uh, legitimate endings to a story that maybe the story was weaker than, um, you know, from a plot point of view, than one story that was moving ahead to, to one outcome. And the other thing was, you know, adding these curriculum aspects. If you're trying to have the kids learn something, remember something, make some good guesses based on what they've read, um, you're you're kind of directing them, in a way, to the ending. And so when we went from that multiple ending format, and it happened pretty quickly, um, to the one ending, they got a lot longer and more complex so that the kids w- would feel that they had accomplished something by the time they got all the way through it, and that and that it was worth going back and and uh, making a couple of attempts to get it right. So you mentioned earlier um, you play some of the games and things from the competition, and I'm curious about what from the uh, what from other sources was your inspiration? What things did you borrow or steal from? Oh. What, what way did well, you find it see. different from the leading brand? Yeah, there was um well my husband and I we were dating at that point but he was he was um a graphic uh, designer at Scholastic. Um he and I were complete fans of text adventures and um used to play those a lot and of course there was no imagery on those it was all text. Um and that sort of I I liked the idea of that and of course we've been doing twisted plots where full screen graphics would come up but then we did a couple where 
um, you have a much more primitive graphic, but it would be the top half of the screen, and then you'd have a lengthy caption underneath. So that was, in a way, sort of blending the two ideas, you know, where you could move from room to room, and the text would change accordingly, and the challenges would change accordingly. So mm -hmm. that was just one sort of small subset of the Twist of Plus. I was also, um, we're huge fans of Load Runner, and uh, so the I <laughs> Um, complete obsession with that, and uh, I'm trying to think which one that that sort of prompted. There was Load Runner, and um, oh, Tetris was a big one, and we were trying to. We didn't really figure that one out. We we're trying to figure out how could we do spatial relations and and shapes and things like that. Um, that that was more in a Microzine Junior thing where they were playing with shapes and things, and you know, of course, we did a much more elementary. Um, it, it wasn't like falling dead. It wasn't like a video game thing, but we got the idea of well, let's do something with shapes and colors that they could do. Um, a lot of it was just, you know, you sort of come in and you just sort of play a game for 30 minutes and then, then you feel like you're ready to go to work. So um, we would do stuff like that and uh, try to have our bosses understand we're actually working. Um, it's research. Yeah. <laughs> But it, it was it was more to just sort of get warmed up and into it, you know. It's um, I think the thing that would have been a killer is if we'd gotten bored um, at, at that at that whole idea. You know, if you're getting bored, you're not going to come up with anything fun for the kids. So um, so it was, it was more like that, you know. Just sort of I, I was um, I, I guess it was the text adventures that I was thinking of when I mentioned that to you that I was just trying to think of how I can combine a lot of text on the screen, you know, from a kid's point of view, a lot of text, um, and a little minimal graphic that sort of keeps them intrigued and moving from from point to point. What haven't I asked you yet that I should have? Uh -huh. about, about developing it or... Um, about the whole experience. About any of it. About the whole experience. I, I bet you have um, a story that you haven't told me. I well, I wish that it had been, or we had figured out, or I had figured out a, a way to make it less expensive to produce because I think it was such a great idea, and I don't, and we didn't run out of ideas for programs. So I wish. I wish there were a way that we could have kept advancing with the software and, and the machines and everything and um, to keep it going because I, I, I think it was um, it was great for its time and I, I wish it could have continued. I, God, the developers, when we, when we went from the, you're going to laugh at this, when we went from the Apple II Plus to the 2C, Mm -hmm. those guys were ecstatic. And I remember, <laughs> because there was so much more we could do. I mean, there was all this energy. And I, I remember one guy saying, you know, that Apple II Plus is a Ford and this 2C is a Ferrari. You know, he was like so excited about that. And, and so um, I, I wish we could have kept it going to, you know, what what's going on now. You know, I, my kids have... You know, they sort of look back on what we did and they sort of roll their eyes and go, like, really? And I said, you don't understand. <laughs> back in the day, this was really cool. And uh, your mother was at the forefront of this stuff. You know, we were all these great people and we really felt like we were making this big difference in the schools and um, having the teachers welcome it and the parents maybe not so alarmed and the, have the kids engaged. So um, the other thing that was that was nice about that um that I don't think I talked about was um, we did a lot of school visits where we took um, software and development into the schools and um, I was paired up an editor with one of the programmers and they, they went out as a team and I think that benefited the product a lot because the programmers had this incredible skill. They were so brilliant at what they did but to see it in use with with not someone as skilled as they were, um, a ten year old kid or an eight year old kid, and to see what they could and couldn't do was a real eye opener for them. And I think the product benefited because I think they came back um, with a better understanding of who their actual audience. I mean, the kids weren't our customers, but they were our audience. So 
we wanted this to be for them and um and of course the editors got a big snoot full of what was and wasn't working <laughs> as far as how the program was designed, you know, something that seems so clear to you. And then you go and you watch somebody else try to understand your directions on the screen or something and they're not getting it. It's um that was important too. So I'm kind of all over the place here. Um I I I guess um I guess I wish that there were something like this that came out periodically for kids in schools. I, I just think it would be really fun. The 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 trouble is that, you know, things change so quickly now and the technology changes so fast that I'm not sure that um a dev- you know, publishing company would be able to keep up with it. Yeah. yeah it's going to be now an, an iPad app that's good for a few months and that would be I don't know. Yeah. And then it's gone, and and you you just invest enormous resources in terms of money and time and people to to get something good, you know. And um, yeah. if you can't sell it for very long, that's um, you're not going to be able to do it. So, right. Anyway. So, how, why did Microzine come to an end? Uh, I think that the market was. It just wasn't making enough money, quite frankly. Um, people, it, I think the market got a little bit saturated and it just got too expensive and, and Scholastic scoff, software was um, in full swing then and I think that they wanted to devote more time to different products and one-off products, mm-hmm. which which would, you know, stay for a couple of years. And it was, it was, it was absolutely, I think, one of the more um, expensive items to produce. So I think they felt that th- that we'd had a good run and it was it was time for them to move on. Yeah. It did have a good run. It was 9 years or almost 9 years. I uh, know. I know. We're proud of that. <laughs> yeah. So I I'm still in touch with a lot of these folks, you know, and um a lot of these authors and things, you know, people who who write for kids, you know, they they never go away. They're always doing stuff and they're always <laughs> On to the next thing, and you know this one woman, Lori Hopping, is is now designing um, ESL games. You know she's living in Michigan and just doing incredible stuff and designing stuff for adults and kids because she's a game designer. And just you know, to, and she worked on uh, I think it was Science World, Scholastic that magazine, which was a great magazine, and uh, sort of took all those skills and just took it to the next next event. Nice. Well, I hope to uh, talk with her soon. Um, yeah, she's she's fascinating. She's a good person. So I just got back a couple of weeks ago from Kansas Fest, which is an annual conference of Apple II devotees. And <laughs> there were seventy Neat. people there. Yeah, it was it was it's a lot of fun. And uh, people there, you know, hacking on Apple II. I just want you to know that people like remember Microzine and talk fondly of it. And um, Oh, that's some, so nice some, to hear. Um, that's, that's really well, lovely to hear. I, I was reaching out to Jeff Siegel, and he he was he's wrapped up in a bunch of stuff, and he couldn't talk to you. And he, but he commented on it. He said, "That is so incredibly great to hear that something that we worked on so hard and cared a lot about that that people liked it and remembered it." So that's really so nice. I'd, I'd like to ask you um, if you could send a message to those grown-ups who were kids using Microzine back in the day, and and you can send them a message right now, um, what would you tell them? Oh, um, that I hope that they're still really excited about trying new things, whether it's on the computer or anywhere else, that I hope they still have all that energy and enthusiasm that makes them actually pick up a pencil and write to somebody who's working on it, because... We get as excited about it as they do. So I just hope the energy and excitement's still there. I think that's all I have. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> okay, well, that's great. I hope it was helpful. It was this lovely is, to talk great. to you. Actually, before we start, I just sure. wanted to show you from my archives. Can you see? I can, yeah. My Cuisine Junior. Nice, There's nice. a microzine. These are some of the ones that I wrote. I have a couple that I wrote that I no I no longer have the floppy disks. Like, and I whether they're good or not, I have no idea. Yeah, but these yeah. are still shrink wrapped. So nice. I just put them in the archive, and uh, he reminded me I still had them. So sweet. I know a guy who's uh, 
because um, those things were copy protected, and so yeah. some of them are out there now, and some of them are not. And I, I know a guy who like goes in there and like breaks the copy protection on things like Microzine and, and makes them available. Because uh, yeah, I found I found Escape from Ancatrays. I found an emulator, you know, and I found it online. I you know I thought it was great. I think it's cool because I mean nobody's selling it. Nobody can use them anymore. So right. Any, you know, getting them out there is a thrill for somebody who's, you know, participating in the creative process anyway. <laughs> can't, can't talk for the business end. <laughs> right. um, how'd you, so how'd you get started at Scholastic? Well, I started out on a, just fresh out of college at a new startup magazine called Electronic Learning. Very, very first uh, magazine there about when PCs first came out. So this was 1982. Mm-hmm. And so classrooms and schools were just getting their very first PCs. We had TRS-80s. We had... Um, I, you know, that was the main machine, actually. We had the Radio Shack was kind of dominating for that short period of time. And I had never seen a PC before. And they put me on the staff of this as a gopher, as a reporter, as an editorial assistant um, for the summer. And I had to learn computers one-on-one from scratch. I was a liberal arts uh, major, uh, English and French literature. So this was um, not, not, not uh, you know, not... Uh, completely unhappy with math. I like math a lot, but I had not had no experience with computers. So that led to the job with teaching in computers, another spin-off magazine for teachers where I learned basic programming. And that that was back in the day when you wrote basic programs, you typed them and then you had to convert them for all the different machines and then you printed them in the magazine and teachers would type, you know, laboriously type letter for letter and hope they got all the semicolons in place because, my goodness, if you missed a semicolon, <laughs> the program didn't work. And so I, you know, I wrote for, there was like a one or two year period before the software came out, before the software really blossomed. And um, teachers were just uh, cr- clamoring for um, material and programs. So basic programming gave way to uh, uh you know, uh, you know, program on floppy disks, right? So everybody started doing floppy disks, and so Scholastic started a software division. I think it was the mid '80s. Um, I could be corrected on that. Amy would know better because she ended up heading the editorial there. Um, and they tapped me because nobody knew how to do this stuff. Nobody knew computers. Nobody understood user response. Nobody understood, you know, that your your viewer is a character. You know, um, and so they hired a lot of writers to do these who, you know, we were all pi- sort of pioneering and struggling through this new medium. Um, but because I had done a lot of choose your own adventure kind of stuff and, hi- you know, the old books and the, you know, understood how the basic programming logic worked and understood this, you know, the if then loops and the, you know, conditional clauses, um, I went to town with it. I loved it. I loved my very first video uh, game script that I wrote, this Escape from Ancatraz launched me in this whole new direction, whole new career, whole new way of thinking of story, uh, relating to the user, having a dialogue with the user, anticipating what they're going to do, um, really, really some of the most difficult kind of writing to do, um, and for me that was fun and a challenge. So I wrote, um, you know, in the period when Microzine was around, um, gosh, I think it uh, lasted, I don't know, four or five years, um, you know, it was a sweet spot where you could be a writer on a video game, and they would hire the writers first, and then the then the artists, and then the coders, and that all got flopped around when the graphics took over, and we went into the CD-ROM era. And so, um, for Microzine, the way it worked is, uh, no, you know, there was no there were no protocols. There was nobody knew how to do this. Nobody there was no best practices. Um, people were doing it all different kinds of ways. I literally wrote almost like a movie script you know, with hyperlinks, you know, embedded in text to tell where to go if the user presses this and that. And that works when you have a 64K machine and, you know, your graphics are, you know, mostly static. Um, I think somewhere in the middle uh, of that, they introduced two-part animation. That was a big thing. Oh, we can do two-part animation now. We have, we have room. We have space, which means my aunt antenna could go like that and then that. <laughs> Two parts, right. you yeah. can move different ways, HB, and that was big, yeah. yeah, big breakthrough for the graphics, you know, in this in this game. So really, like I said, a very um, interesting time to be a writer because it was a golden era to be a writer for video games. Um, there was no training, no degrees in that. It was wild west. It was wide open. Yeah. So did did your uh, method for creating them change over time, or did you stick to your the thing that you just described with making a kind of a hyperlinked outline? Well, the industry changed drastically, and I mean dramatically. Um, the last of the floppy disks, and when the when the graphics came into the CD-ROM era, I did a lot of CD-ROM work for Microsoft and 
uh, Edmark and IBM and um, Scholastic um, uh, Magic School Bus and things like that. Very, very much more of a team approach mm -hmm. and very mm -hmm. much more led by art and design, interactive design, so that you, you know, the writing almost came later. Writing almost came as text filler in some ways in some of those games. And uh, the visuals and the interactives became really the storytelling engines um, in, in the CD-ROM era. And, and for good reason. I mean, really, it's, it's video. They're video games. It really is a visual medium. And also, is this, the strength of the medium is interactive. The strength of the medium is that dialogue with the user, and that really needs to be nailed. Um, I think, uh, primo, first, you have to define your character and define your relationship with your user first before you write anything. For, and, and scripting has, is, is still changing. It's still morphing and, and evolving, video game scripting, um, I think, in a lot of different ways. The last couple of um, projects I've worked on um, you know, have, have all been different. The writing, the writing process has been really, really different. I'm on a, what's more of a digital novel right now, um, more, more story than game. There, there's interactives, but <clears throat> I'm actually the narrative designer, and there's a separate lead writer who's just doing text, and then there's a coder artist who's basically scripting in game. You know, so you want to go look in the game, you want to be in the game, and say, what's going to happen here? Do we need it? any text? You know, what do we do here? So, so it's gone completely in game, and it's gone very visual. There's, uh, you know, there, the if then conditional loops are all done visually now, so that. Mm -hmm. You know, even I can follow what's going to happen on uh, the game states as, as you're writing. So that's been a huge change. That's, um, that's what I'm working on right now, called Inanimate Alice. Awesome. So before it sounded like it was super story driven, that was, I mean, the story was everything and you had to work around that. What kind of constraints did you have to create creativity? Creativ what constraints did you have to work around creatively? Creatively. 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 Um, you know, it was it was the wild west. I'm just going to say, even for an educational product, we had curriculum, we had a topic. All these all these microzine uh, games and programs were learning. It was first there was for a school audience and a home audience, but really education came first. So biggest constraint was a conventional one was it had to hit it had to teach kids. It had to teach kids certain things, and it still had to be fun. And that's still a challenge. That's still the big challenge in educational publishing for any in almost any medium. So I think that was it. The second, the technical challenge really was the memory. Really was the computer memory, really restrictive. And as a writer, you want to expand and do this and, and have this happen and do you know go over here and really in a very compact way, you had to think about graphics economically. So uh, one of the programs I did, one of the programs I wrote, twisted my brain around this was called Safari where because the graphics were so limited, I set the whole thing in one place. So you're in one safari location, but you play as six different animals. So even though you, you go into the setting six different times, you can play the game six different times, if you're a different animal, you're going to have different experiences and different reactions. You're either a predator or a prey. You know, you have to find certain food. There's going to be a certain adventure. But the graphics stayed static, essentially. And they, you know, it allowed a lot, you know, a lot more of other things that to happen in that, so that you had a lot more room in the in the in the in the code to um, to do other things by keeping the graphics simple. Um, so that was one solution. Um, wouldn't have to do that these days. I mean, these days you could take each animal on, you know, infinite procedurally generated <laughs> worlds of adventure and you know, endless endless safari if you wanted to. And so, you know, that was definitely a constraint. It was um, during the eighties, I think by the nineties that loosened up. So you did uh, Antcatraz, you did Safari. What other games did you do for Microzine? I did um, Quest for the Pole, which was a lot of fun. Now, this was interesting because Quest for the Pole was non based on nonfiction, based on a true story, the Franklin Expedition in the Arctic. And so I did a lot of research and did a lot of kind of uh, um, fact-checking on this, but it's still a branching adventure story. It's still a survival story. You know, do this, you die. Do this, you don't. Uh, it's, you know, um, pretty classic branching text adventure. And because it was based on a true story and I wasn't making stuff up, I mean, the endings were, were, you know, essentially real. You learned a lot about sled dogs and things like that. It was just um, kind of a departure because An Ancatraz was similar in the way that you were learning about ants and it was fact-based, but the adventure itself was, was really science fiction because you're not really an ant. You're not really trapped inside of an anthill, whereas uh, Quest for the Pole was a um, pretty, pretty good, uh, straightforward adventure. Mm -hmm. Oh, else? I, yeah. I, yeah, that's right. I almost forgot. I did the Balloonatics, which um, was sort of a uh, Jules Verne, you know, 80 days around 
uh, in the balloon, but it was a language arts adventure, and so you're just going in this in this balloon to these different locations and, and with a learning game embedded in it. So kind of a, you know the text was really the whole adventure was just a structure to get you to practice your grammar and your language, and it's for younger children. So Microsoft Junior, the Junior version I'm looking at now is from six ages six to eight. Um, and, the, and the older version was was nine and up. So, did you ever get pushback from editors or saying this this is <laughs> needs to be more educational or this isn't it's, it's super educational but it's not fun or you know how did you find that balance and did you have to argue you know, with people about it? Well, that would be Amy, <laughs> one of my, my favorite editors on the planet. <clears throat> no, she was great to work, really, really great to work with, and she and. Scholastic is one of the biggest educational publishers in the world, and so they're able to attract a lot of really top-level, you know, skilled people at doing that. That's what they do. They understand the audience. They understand the kids. And Amy, in particular, was really, really uh, uh, good about letting me shape the story. Um, with Ancatraz, with the first one I wrote in particular, you know, she, I just had a topic. She just gave me the topic, and I remember sitting there. Well, you want to be inside the ant hill, but then what happens? And, and I remember completely inventing every little chamber that you went to, every little uh, section that you went to, all the choices that you made, and as long as it, the science was solid, as long as the ants acted the way they were supposed to, in the sense of, you know, scientifically, if they were this kind of ant, they were going to behave this way, it was okay that they talked, you know, I mean, even those with the science can be talking ants, so there was some discussion about that, you know, there's scientists who rebel a little bit about anthropomorphizing, but it's an adventure game, it's an adventure story, and the fun really came from the personalities of the ants, I had Arnolda, the soldier, you know, was really strong from Arnold Schwarzenegger. I had, you know, I just had some really corny stuff in there that they left in there. <laughs> That's great. That was a lot of fun. Did you get any feedback from students and teachers? I, you know, I don't remember getting a lot. Um, I wasn't on that end of it. You know, Amy would know for sure because I know they did a lot of testing. And they uh, certainly the marketing people would tell you exactly, you know, exactly what that is. But I really, I, as I think I mentioned to you um, a couple of years ago, somebody contacted me who was a Microzine fan, and the Microzine kids are grown up now. Anybody who had you know had this program or remembers it, you know, this was thirty years ago, right? Am I right? Almost thirty years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah they're now parents, right? So, you know, some of these pro programs and games were the things that they remember doing as kids. And, and there's a sweet spot, I think, when, when you're 8 to about 12, the things that you do at that age become magical. And when you become an adult, that's what you look back to. You know, like that's what trading baseball cards or whether it's collecting figurines or, you know, Beanie Babies or whatever it was you did from 8 to 12 in that sweet spot. Um, I think you, you, you end up with a fondness and a nostalgia for that, that I think is really sweet and does come back to me every once in a while. On Twitter, somebody contacted me, had found Ancatraz and said, oh my gosh, you're the Ancatraz lady. And, you know, the guy's, again, in his 30s or 40s, they're, you know, somewhere up there. Um, and it's kind of fun. It's really, it's really a fun part of being, having stuff out there, even if it's not, you know, uh, on floppy disk and not streaming. <laughs> right. <laughs> Did you play Microzine? Did this was something that you remember? Um, I had seen it, but I was an Atari kid, and my 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 school had TRS eighties for some reason, not apples, like every other school in the world. So I'm, I'm cert I was certainly aware of it, and I but no, I I wasn't. I somehow missed it. But okay, so I just went go to this um I go to this annual conference of Apple II users, and uh, it's called Kansas Fest, and this year seventy people were there. Um, who were people really into the Apple II, and people talk about Microzine. You know, it's like one of those, you could be walking through the hallways and people yep. just talking about it or showing off or, you know, talking about twist of plots and things. So um, I think there's so many people who, who remember who remember it and use the magazine and, and enjoy the, the twist of plots. So I got, this piqued my interest because I saw there was an Atari version, and then Amy said that they published one Atari edition, and then they decided to go straight Apple. So, so, um, so that's where you heard about it. Well, that's an, I didn't know about the Apple II convention. That's interesting. I'm going to check that, check that out. It's called can... Kansas Fest, and uh, okay. it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm going to check that out because it's, kind of, it's a trip down memory lane for me. I mean, it was, I, you know, when we were creating these things, we had no idea at the time how, how this whole industry would take off. You know, the, the promise was there, and you certainly you saw computers were going to take over. No, I don't think anybody would have disputed that you know, when the PCs first came on the scene. But it's it's now bigger than movies. The video game industry is now bigger than movies, and it's just it's one of the mainstream mediums now for communication and storytelling. 
And to see the innovation over the last 30 years has just been unbelievable for me. I mean, my career essentially spans that. I mean, 1982 up till now, you know, was that's it. That's the, that's the tech innovation era um, for this kind of thing. So yeah. that's just, you know, keeping up with it has been a little tough. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's faster now than it did then, than it was fast then. Um, so, what other magazines, uh, computer magazines, did you did you work on? Did we talk about them all? I, I just did the two. I started started my career in those two magazines. I worked there for four years, and mm-hmm. then I freelanced. Then I went freelance and worked for all the other Scholastic magazines, which were classroom magazines. And I worked for the software division. I worked for the a little bit for the television division there. So basically, my career is more of a writer. And the computer thing was. Um, I'm not going to say foisted on me because I loved it. Um, nobody wanted to do it. You know, if you graduate with an English degree. And they say, oh, you're going to work in a computer magazine. That's a really tough fit, especially back then when nobody was using computers regularly. They were all new and different. And so I think I kind of fell into that a little bit, and a little bit luckily so, because, it was, like I said, it was a very golden era. And now you pretty much have to be a tech head to get a job on a, any kind of computer magazine, and, and I certainly wasn't at the time. Um, but um, So the computer thing really, I ended up to, uh, editing a science magazine, because they thought, well, you know computers, you must know science. I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> I can figure out computers. I can figure out science, right? And um, that launched a whole science writing career. So I've done a lot of science books. And I edited a math magazine, same reason. Oh, you've done computers, you know, you know, why don't you edit our math magazine? I'm like, okay, I did a few issues of that. And so it, I ended up in this, these STEM fields kind of walking backwards. You know, they kind of just kept pulling me. <laughs> <laughs> pulling me into these, into these um, topics, which I, you know, again, I ended up. Uh, I made a really good career in science writing. I love science now. I didn't when I first started out, and I really, really love science. And um, so that ended up being probably the most thing I've written about is science. And and now, like I said today, I'm back to fiction. So the back in my back into my sweet spot, which was my literature major, <laughs> finally back to fiction. Nice. So this will be listened to by dozens or perhaps hundreds of people who used Microzine and played your twisted plot games. You can send them a message right now. What would you say to them? Oh, I would say thank you. <laughs> I would say, and I would love to hear your memories because it's been so long. I mean, I, and like you said, I really didn't get a lot of f- direct feedback. And I, I, I really I would also like to know what people are playing now, you know, where that led to. You know, all those things that we created, a lot of the things that we were pioneering in kind of in the very early 80s, of probably up to 88, 89, I see now iterated out there in different forms, like grow your plants and take care of them. We had a we had a program like that. We had a game like that at Scholastic. And now it's like Farmville, right? So I, I'm really, really curious about that, about the evolution. So if people are Microzine fans and something in there, they're, they, they're, still, they're still on that same track that set them on some kind of a beloved, you know, uh, kind of programming or game that they love, I would love to hear that, um, especially still being in the industry, you know, what, what resonates, what works. Great. Is there anything I haven't asked you yet that I should have? Um. Gosh, I can't think of anything. Um, I, I think, uh, too, if you get a chance to talk to some of the other writers, um, I, I just want to say that uh, Amy, uh, I can't speak highly enough of Amy because she really was and is my favorite editor on the planet for pioneering a lot of this, um, worked with a lot of talent. Like, you know, Scholastic can, can draw some talent, and some of the other writers are super, super uh, proud and, and, and a little intimidated to be on the same playing with them at the time. I was in my 20s, and uh, they brought in some heavy hitters. They brought in some authors and some people who had to adjust to the medium. You know, really, really, uh, I, I can remember uh, reading a, a piece about William Faulkner trying to write a screenplay, and, and what a disaster, because <laughs> it was like, look, you have to a little tiny, you know, dialogue and sentences, and it really is a different way of thinking about story. And uh, I think that was an interesting challenge, an interesting puzzle. And I, I never look back. I, that's my career. Now. That's the, that's the one, number one thing I like to do is interactive writing. And um, other people, it was you know, it went back to novels, and you know, I, I get the text and I, you know, immersion in a story. So that would be an interesting conversation to see where where the other writers ended up. You know, if they stuck with it or went back, you know, to other media. You know, what they did. I have what I need. Thank you so much. All right. Good to talk to you, Kevin. Thank you.